Great. So, ladies and gentlemen, we have another episode of the Kettle Knights podcast. I have with me our guest today is James Ross. He's a personal trainer, strength and conditioning coach, and sports scientist, and also a founder and coach at the Richmond Gym in Melbourne. He's also won amateur 10 and 30 minute double long cycle at World Championships and placed third in both biathlon and long cycle with 32 kgs in 2019. James has done research into different snatch styles, including four kettlebell sport world champions as well as amateurs. And this is what we're going to probably talk about the most in today's podcast. James, welcome to the pod. Thanks for having me on. It's a pleasure. Awesome. So, James, what I always like to do in the beginning is give us your background, how you got started with kettlebells and how it led to the place where you are now. Sure. Um, so, I... I did my personal training course um, in 2004 and uh, a friend of mine that I was doing the course with, he mentioned these kettlebells and I, I didn't really understand what they were. They're like, they're dumbbells, but they lit, like they look like a kettle. Like what, yeah. what's going on? Yeah. I apologize if you can hear my son too as well. He's totally um, fine. going a bit nuts. Totally fine. Anyway, um, yeah, so that piqued my interest. And um, at that time in Australia, there, there weren't too many of them around. Um, but fortunately, a company called Australian Kettlebells, funnily enough, opened up pretty near nearby, and um, I was able to get my first kettlebell in 2005 or thereabouts. Initially, sort of using kind of like a hard style sort of approach, um, you know, that was sort of the main sort of documentation, or you know, get various mm -hmm. different books and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, the internet wasn't what it was, or what yeah. it was it is now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Then so. It was, it was kind of just, you know, having a go at it. And um, in Australia, it's quite interesting. Like I mentioned to you, we, we had um, this company called Australian Kettlebells and they started doing certifications and things like that. And they had, in a way, well, they had a, a, a physical trainer from the Russian military who'd moved to Australia and he was sort of running those. And um, that was quite eye-opening because I thought, sort of thought I was, you know, using it right. Like probably a lot of people do when they pick up a kettlebell <laughs> and they've too. got a bit of a background. <laughs> I'm using this right. This is fine. Oh, and then I you're remember like, oh, me I've too. I've got so yeah, much yeah. to learn. And then <laughs> your hamstrings never feel the same again no. after the sort of the first sort of time you start doing proper yeah, exercises. So definitely. that was a really eye-opening experience. And I was very fortunate mm. to um, uh, not do that much work with him directly, but um, a pe some people that I started a gym with. Um, mm. did a lot of training with him and um, uh, very fortunate to be tutored by Emily Friedel, who um, traveled to the US and did a lot of training with Valeri Fedorenko and the WKC. Emily and, Emily um, Friedel, right? Emily. Yeah, right. yeah. So she was able to, to, she's one of the first people to hit Master of Sport um, in Australia. And she wow. traveled regularly to the Ice Chamber, which I don't believe yeah. is around anymore, but they were sort of pretty... Well Brittany and Schravendijk, she mentioned this. Uh, she was training with the girls from from the ice, kettlebell ice chamber, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. you know, being again, um, I was I was into athletics at the time, and you know, I was sick of. Um, so, I'd, I was as a coach um, and also doing sports science and stuff. I try not to be too sciencey in the sense that I try to have a practical understanding of things. Mm -hmm. So I thought, oh, I've got to get better at speed training, so I'm going to join the athletics club. So I did about three seasons of athletics, and I used kettlebell training a lot and some weightlifting stuff, power snatches and whatever. Um, and, you know, I got sick of these 15 year olds. Again, I wasn't very good at athletics. 15 year olds were running way faster than me. So I gave myself this super advanced program and uh, ended up getting all these <laughs> overuse injuries. I, I ran somewhat <laughs> fast by my standards, mm -hmm. um, although I may have, you know, got someone to mess with the stopwatch. So it looked better for me, but um, in the end, I couldn't do any like sort of hard style or like really hip hingey type movements because I got mm. a tendinopathy um, in my hamstring. And wow. that's actually how I sort of was speaking to Emily and seeing what she was doing. She was doing the kettlebell sports stuff. And I was like, okay, maybe I'll give this a go. Instead of doing snatches after I do a heavy deadlift for like three reps or something, I'll do, you know, a 16 kilo snatch for, you know, five minutes, maybe that'll be challenging because I was sort of just looking for a physical challenge, I think, because when you, you know, can't do certain things, then you sort of try to find something. And that's, mm -hmm. that's how yeah. I sort of got into kettlebell sport. And I haven't really looked back too far since then. Um, but I was pretty lucky that, um, 
you know, Emily was doing what she's doing. And I think I mentioned as well, um, Steve Cotter came and did a course that she attended. I didn't actually get to go to that one, but that was pretty early on, um, wow. mid to late yeah. 2000s, mm-hmm. I, I believe. Mm-hmm. And so benefiting from that knowledge and things like that. Fascinating. That's sort of how I got started and, you know, um, progressively did a bit more, um, you know, sports science stuff. And I, then I was like, oh, it'd be cool to look at some kettlebell sports stuff and, and yeah. apply. Yeah. I guess what I try to do is um, – look at sort of Western science and apply that to some extent, or at least my understanding of that to sort of um, kettlebell sport and, and things like that, because it's not that easy to get a hold of the research. And then um, yeah. I've been lucky enough mm-hmm. to speak to a few researchers in Russia and uh, it's hard to sort of interrogate how they did the research and things like that. You sort of, it almost seems more applied, like they did this and this result happened. And mm-hmm. there's a little bit of the nitty gritty stuff that you get more interested in the more you do science stuff like the methodology so you can replicate yeah. it and things like that which mm-hmm. gets a little bit lost mm-hmm. so um that's where i sort of thought oh it'd be cool to do some stuff myself um it sounds like a really good idea doing research but it's like um i'm not sure if neil mentioned is it's a lot harder than yeah, it's it's a chore that, he said this yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a lot harder than um, it looks right <laughs> yeah it's it's good fun and it's really interesting and you get mm. very excited um like i'd bother all the sports science professors i'd just be like talking their ears off but after a while they'd sort of start closing their doors on me because i'd be like um and it always the answer is just always it depends but you know know we try to tease out the context and things like that but i think that's probably and i know and you know that's so funny you know from from the coach's perspective yes it depends is such a huge mantra but sometimes people need some clear guidance we can't just walk around and tell everybody well it depends just do whatever you please and, and see but some people need some guidance right so what i'm really interested in james is uh, you mentioned tendinopathy right can, can, can you explain what this exactly is yeah so it's just a sort of at least my understanding uh, not as zero, um, as a sports scientist it's just an umbrella term for a tendon injury um oh. so um Tendons don't have the same blood supply as muscles do, so they can get, um, a, you know, a bit more of an overuse injury. So specifically with the proximal or uh, a hamstring tendinopathy, which is basically just where your sits bone or your your glute is, kind of where that, um, or the il- uh, ischial tuberosity, uh-huh. where the hamstring attaches uh-huh. in there. If uh-huh. you're doing really deep hip injuries, so there's probably some. I think they some people call it yoga butt or probably if you do really deep kettlebell hip hinges yeah. too often extreme you, extreme hip hinging right yeah so yeah, the, yeah, yeah. the the issue of tuberosity again i'm not a physio i'm just this is my understanding that the tendon can cam around that and tendons are really good in stretch but they're not very good in compression and so it can get irritated uh, oh, wow. like that oh. so um oh, that's where someone maybe would benefit from um uh, a different Kettlebell Softer sport, swinging. or you could do like yeah, a, yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Oh. or like um, a, a squat style just to unload that a little bit. Um, I'm not a fan of a squat style where you keep the torso up, but I'm, I'm not against a squat ta- style where you sort of bend forward a yeah. little bit. Oh. I mean, at all different contexts, again, they, they all have application. Um, but that's for me how I got into kettlebell sport. Wow. I may have um, not bent, you know, I've just avoided that painful range of motion. Um, that's fascinating. And, Again, with the kettlebell sport swing or snatch, you sort of have that double knee bend, which yeah, is kind of, which takes it away has the like load, extra right? phases. Ah, yeah, and yeah, um, yeah. so I think, yeah, so because of there's the extra phases, yeah, you're not as explosive from the end of the backswing. You reposition yeah. and then you sort of yeah. power through. Wow. And originally um, in Australia, we were sort of using sort of Valeri Fedorenko style. Um, and he'd been out quite a few times. Um, and that's who Emily was sort of learning a lot wow. from, or at least that sort of lineage. And his coach, um, Philokitis, I believe his name is, he's quite, you can you can see some videos. I think he runs, um, is it when Kettle, uh, WKC, World Kettlebell Club, mm. had their own sort of affiliations mm-hmm. around the world. Mm-hmm. Um, I think he ran the Greek Kettlebell Sport Club, but uh, originally okay. he's from, from, from Greece. Leave. Oh. Okay. Uh, I think Russia somewhere, oh, or okay. like part of the USSR. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, he mm. has a strong Olympic lifting background, and then, you know, Valeri sort of using this classic style of kettlebell sport snatch, which, you know, you kind of have these extra phases. Um, so I believe, say in um, Enter 
again, I'm not an RKC or a strong first instructor, um, but you sort of in, in is enter the kettlebell, they talk about the swing being, or the snatch being like a three stage rocket. I think they, that's a term they use, which is like, you've got the ex sort of explosive hip motion, then you've got yep. the, the yep. pull and the punch through. Mm -hmm. So with the kettlebell sports snatch, you sort of have these extra sort of motion yep. that almost comes out of Olympic lifting. So in Olympic lifting, you have your first pull, the mm -hmm. transition, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then you get into that power position where you have mm -hmm. that pull. second pull, mm -hmm. which is the most yeah explosive mm -hmm. portion. So with the kettlebell sports swing, it's got that cyclical nature. So you have the backswing comes back. Yeah. And then from here, this is, so you've got the backswing, then you've got the forward swing, which is almost like that transition. You're just repositioning yourself into a stronger position. Mm -hmm. And in the context of kettlebell sport, you're trying to be relaxed yeah. and just apply enough force yeah. to complete the rep. So you're waiting for it to say, just pass your knees. And then, then you sort of apply a bit of force. Yes. You accelerate it up. Um, and uh, yeah, you're accelerating it up and sort of slightly backwards as opposed to projecting it out and yeah. upwards. Which, which is the idea of creating efficiency, right? And, and Yeah, exactly. And, and what you're also mentioning, uh, since you're talking about Valerie, uh, I had Valerie on the podcast as well, and he said, "Yeah, that was a great episode. I really it's, enjoyed that." It's also very enlightening, where he talked about the idea of of I call it now unloading the lower back because when you are hinging at an extreme level, for example, if you do a very heavy deadlift and you have this strong hip hinge, right? So this can really increase the blood flow in your lower back, and then it gets tight. And then he said the 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 heavyweights, the guys in in the gym. Ciao, Danilo. Cheers. Uh, the heavyweights in, in, in the gym, they were swinging with a rounded back to unload the lower back so that this tightness uh, releases. So it was so, sort of like a relaxing maneuver. So that's when people see this, they're like, wow, that's wrong technique when you bend your lower back, but you're not actually just bending it to an extreme measure because you're not you're not swinging as hard as you would in a hard style swing. So there's a huge difference. And now what you're saying, makes sense as well if you have let's say like just say an issue in 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 your in, in in your hips or where your glutes are situated and every time you go into an extreme hinge you feel this impingement or this pain then of course you have to find a different way to hinge which of course leads them to another way of swinging weights right or just another another style of training and what what comes to mind as well is i had one um uh, a gentleman write me an email and he said, you know what's fascinating? Doing a softer version of the swing, even if you're not using the double bent knee, I, I just hinge, and I call it the hybrid swing, I hinge completely, but I just don't use as much force as you would in a hard style swing and with a moderate weight, so 20, 24 kg. And this gentleman mentioned that he's having hemorrhoids, uh, if I'm saying this correctly, right. is it, right? It's an English word, Hem right? Hemorrhoids? H hemorrhoids, it, hemorrhoids, yeah, yeah. And he said, when he's doing the heart style swing, he always feels this, this piercing pain in his groin area. But when he's doing the softer version, he can swing indefinitely. So what I'm trying to say with a lo very long explanation is we have to, here it comes to, it depends context again, but we have to understand that there's different styles, different appro approaches, which can work for different people, right? Absolutely. And I think when you think about the principles of exercise is one of the big ones is individualization. Like we're all individuals. We all have, yeah. we're all, you know, the same species, but we, yeah. we do respond differently. Yeah. Um, and with Valeri's um, comment about rounding the back from a biomechanics point of view, you're sort of shortening the moment arm or you're shortening the leverage, you know, you're, you're shortening yeah. it up there. Um, yeah. I think the other yeah. big thing though, is um, you also, um, if you, um, just if you imagine someone standing up vertically, you know, you're closing that gap, you know, mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. the, the armpit is, yeah. So you've potentially rounded in that position where there's very little force going through and then you're just holding still as it's pulling you forward. Mm -hmm. And so there's quite a few really interesting things um, with, with this sort of stuff. So with, um, I think Neil was sort of talking a lot about ground reaction force, mm -hmm. which is something yep. that I've sort of looked at mm -hmm. um, and um, basically we've probably both spent a long, long time looking at squiggly lines on a screen. So, um, <laughs> when, when I'm talking about squiggly lines, you've got force along here and you've got time and then sort of, they will just squiggle around like that. So it's really interesting with say like a hard style swing. I think what Neil was alluding to with the technique stuff 
um, he hopefully he corrects me if I'm wrong, but they it's sort of like an upside down U when you look at the up the ground reaction source for so it's like a single loading and a single unloading, whereas with the kettlebell sport style, again it depends on the individual, but it's almost like a McDonald's or an M. Yes. So you have this yes. loading, which is you absorb it. Yeah, you catch it. And yep. then that's like your peak force there or force going through the ground. So it's kind of like the force on your whole body, right? Mm -hmm. As opposed to a specific area. Mm -hmm. um, and then as it goes up the backswing, you're actually kind of trying to relax and the force yeah. is coming down. Um, and then you reposition it and then the force spikes up again. So, yeah. you know, yeah. when... Valeri is probably going through that peak force or a lot of people who do kettlebell sport have a small amount of rounding through there. They're, they're probably in a very strong position and then they're just guiding it through as they're bending forward. And another really interesting thing that um, Neil touched on um, is that with the horizontal force, with the kettlebell sport or the classic sort of swing, you actually reverse it. It's almost like if you were to be jumping backwards. So you actually yeah, relax you, you, through. You lean, th this forward lean, right? When the kettlebell's in the backswing, right? Yeah, and then you reposition and you yeah. get into a stronger position and you apply the force when your arm, oh, this is obviously not the best, but your arm is projecting back up into that fixation. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's almost like you have a slightly, you have that forward component and then you reverse it and you're, you're arresting that momentum. You're, you're, you know, stopping too much momentum going forward, and you're sort of jumping backwards. Wow. You are arresting the momentum. Oh, I like this description. Yeah, well, is, I mean, and then you're this... pulling through your body, right? Yeah, and yeah. you're maneuvering your body, and that's probably one of the big things. Is you kind of, um, I, I forget who used this term, but um, you know, the kettlebell goes one way, and you go the other way. You go the other way. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's and, um, and, not sure. No, what's funny? Well, yeah. What, what's what's funny is is if you know if you feel what happens in your body when you're snatching that way you can most definitely relate to what you're saying so that if somebody has never experienced this it's like what what are you talking about but if you experience it that that you let the bell drop you let it travel you let gravity do its thing and then you go into that j movement right so you go forward to a certain extent depends on if it's more the classic or the modern i like how you make this description um but you are actually giving the kettlebell room, you're giving the weight room and you move with it instead of against it. And isn't this what you are describing? Isn't this the essence of lever mechanics? Well, I mean, you're, you're trying to sort of, um, yeah, I mean, if you almost think about how you're, you're trying to maneuver yourself around yeah, just yeah, to, yeah. you're trying to use as little f muscular force as possible, use your balance. So balance is such an important concept. Um, in particularly kettlebell sport and probably another interesting difference right not everyone does this again with kettlebell sport everyone has their own sort of unique signature they mm -hmm. sort of have the similar principles but mm -hmm. everyone mm -hmm. will have slightly different approaches mm -hmm. so um with one of my first studies where we looked at the 3d um, trajectories of the snatch if you looked at it from the side of these guys who are world champions they it had that loop up on the end and then usually a bigger arc on the way up and a tighter arc on the way down. Yeah. And most of the, the things for um, reining it in or maneuvering it were not so much about bending the arm. It was more just maneuvering their body, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah. Whereas in the hard yeah. style, um, you know, you do the high pull, which, which is, I actually really love the high pull exercise. I, I we'd use it a lot in our gym. Um, great one. If you know, someone can't do snatches, do some presses and some yeah. high pulls. Yeah. Um, yeah. Really awesome exercise. But, um, you know, you, you if you're trying to be as efficient as possible, you're better off moving your whole body as opposed to pulling with your arm. Yeah. So you just kind of maneuver your body weight against it. Um, and that's kind of a way that you can be a bit more efficient with that. And, you, you know, I think what how kettlebell sports snatch has evolved is really interesting. Some people, I, th I think... Typically, it's more so slightly heavier people starting to let the kettlebell come out more to the side, and that's kind of that modern Denisov, style. Denisov, right? That's Denisov. Yeah. <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah, yeah. This, yeah, this exactly. wiggling to the side. Uh, and I, I, I felt the difference when I tried it, of course, not using the weights that Denis is using. Uh, Ivan, uh, Denisov. Denisov is using. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, you feel this complete difference where you are 
uh, I think um, you call it right. If I'm, you have to correct me if I'm wrong. The modern kettlebell sports snatch is where you are moving side to side, right? So you're like, you're not hinging as extreme, but you're using almost only lever mechanics. So you go to the side and you bring it back up and then you go back in, right? And the classic, if, if I'm not mistaken, is the one where you are using more the arc into the hip, right? And more kind of the hingy type of, of snatch. Am, am, I, am I correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. So um, if, if we, um, so I should say, um, again, I'll try to give credit to um, everyone that I can remember. I learned that from Arsini from uh, Laboratory yeah. of Champions. Yeah. He uh, is a, as well. uh, wow. um, did a course with him actually. He's a really friendly guy. Um, and now he um, coaches people, ex-world champion as well. Yeah. Um, Arsini. He has great products. But mm -hmm. um, so we, with the kettlebell sports style, you know, we, we kind of have all the same phases. So you have, let's just say we're starting from the end of the backswing. We've got the forward swing phase. Mm -hmm. Then you've got your acceleration mm -hmm. pull. You have that hand insertion. Mm -hmm. So that acceleration pull to me is like the second pull of weightlifting. And you're trying to be relaxed. And then you go through that acceleration pull. Yeah. And that's where you apply your force. Then you maneuver, you know, the kettlebell. You have that hand insertion where the kettlebell moves to here. And then fixation. Yeah. And then... From fixation, you have the re-gripping, again, maneuvering the kettlebell. Exactly. And then mm -hmm. you have that um, backswing and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, as with the classic style, it sort of followed closer to what an Olympic lifting coach would teach if he was teaching a kettlebell sports snatch. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. where I think it's quite interesting. But then at some point in time, they've realized that, hey, we can go off to the side. And it's worth pointing out that there's fantastic results with both. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, I think if you can balance the kettlebell, it's, it takes a lot of learning as well, that the modern style. So it's one of those things you've got to weigh up the cost to benefit if you want to, you know, um, it, put the time in. Um, but the really cool thing about, say, the classic style is if I'm, again, looking at my squiggly lines, the ground reaction force, you use both legs in the same way. So you use both legs to accelerate and you use both legs to decelerate. Yes. But mm -hmm. when you're using the modern, again, it's mm -hmm. it's different per individual. Mm -hmm. You'll use one leg to accelerate and the other legs like relaxing and then vice versa. Wow. So it's almost like you use one leg because wow. you're going off axis. Yes, so, yes, yes. Um, you know, the kettlebell's out in front, you move away. So you're s stabilizing on the opposite side. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And then yeah. as it passes through your legs, you're stabilizing on the yes. same side. So you're yeah. like leaning in. Yeah. And, and then so what happens back, is yeah. you've got, mm -hmm. when you're doing that, all the forces on the same side leg and it's very little on the other side. And then you're maneuvering and it's switching like that. It's so fascinating. So the, the, the idea is that you can sort of relax um, and, and, you know, be as efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. the, it's also worth pointing out and something I found really fascinating about kettlebell sport um, and also just speaking to a lot of the Russian coaches and they, they always emphasize relaxation, which is something I, you know, always try to pay attention to because it's something I probably forget a bit, but, um, uh, Anton Anasenko would, um, who's another biathlon world champion, really fantastic lifter. He'd always say you, you need to be able to snatch two ways. And if you watch a lot of these guys, and I think you alluded to with, um, Ivan Denisov's snatch technique, like it changes as you know the set goes along because yeah. his grip mm -hmm. is fatigued, so grip. he yeah. modifies his technique. Biceps, muscling it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I'm not. I mean, he can do the bicep muscling thing. Um, I'm not sure it's the best for everyone, yeah, yeah. but <laughs> often people will go to like a squat style. And um, uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. so I was lucky enough to film Anton, and he did. Oh, it's crazy actually. He came to Australia to our gym, um, so we had the Russian. Oh, part of the Russian national team there, um, obviously a number of years ago. Um, and I think when he left his hometown, it's like minus 20 and it was like 40 degrees in Australia. And it was wild because they actually loved it. Like they, you know, they're across the road from the gym in, in the hotel and they didn't put the air conditioning on. They were just like, oh, this is cool. It's like a sauna 24 <laughs> seven. I'm like, all right. It's warm. It's warm. <laughs> we um, love it here. But anyway, he, 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 awesome. he did like... Um, like mid to high 80 reps long cycle with 232s. Wow. And then the next day wow. he did, I filmed it from the side. Um, 
200 and something snatches with <laughs> you know, the next the next day uh, like hey i'm relaxed boy i'm re i'm ready to go another round yeah i mean it's <laughs> really interesting they talk a lot about their their sauna sort of culture which is um it's quite interesting mm -hmm. um you know that various different sauna protocols which obviously i guess ah. work because i think if i went to i think it's winter here oh. in australia and it's like 10 degrees and it's like this is really cold mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i think i'd struggle in minus 20 but wow. but anyway um yeah so it was it's just cool so he he would do his sort of um his style which is probably a bit closer to that modern style but then for the last few reps um he'd switch over to that uh -huh. more of a squat style or more of a um some people call it a dead snatch or a survival snatch. Survival um, it, snatch. It, I wouldn't necessarily oh. call his, you know, thing a survival snatch because it wasn't like a 10 out of 10 effort, but you could just see that just to spare his grip, he would just absorb with his legs a bit more uh, instead of, yes. you know, getting it to come back up, which is a little bit higher peak force comes back up. Um, yes. But yes. then it's kind of more efficient on the body, but you watch, you know, watch these guys' legs. You can see as they go into that backswing, their legs straighten and actually relax. And that just helps with the perfusion or the penetration of the blood into the muscles. Whereas if it's tight and hard the whole time, you don't get that moment of relaxation wow. for the muscles, Isn't like for this, the blood to yeah. get in there. Wow, this is the same technique that these, the, 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 these guys use in the jerk, right? So it's the... Yeah, exactly. They go up, yeah, it's boom, the same principle. They, they land in the second dip. And once they finish the top fixation, they relax their legs. They relax the quads. They go up and you see them shake a little bit. So I've, I've got accustomed to this technique as well. And, and you're saying, uh, can you repeat this? The perforation of the blood, can, can you repeat this? What happens when you yeah, relax yeah. So the muscle? The perfusion, which is just the penetration the of the blood into the muscle. So it's basically, you know, the blood's getting through there. But if the muscle's really switched on and like contracting hard, it won't be able to get in as easily. Ah. So if it can get in and get out so you can you know, supply it with oxygen and, and get rid of oh, different wow. things. So that's where I think a really interesting part of kettlebell sport is. And my brief experience doing athletics is it's all about, you know, it's about speed or it's about applying your force in certain times, but it's also about relaxation, which is a really important thing. So it's, you know, just as much about relaxation as it is implying your force and things like that. So if you can relax your legs in the backswing, that will help you go longer. And it, it's an interesting one with the snatch because sometimes you can, you know, you do a set, but if you sort of forget some of the relaxation yeah. things, then mm -hmm. it really catches up with you. Yeah. I, I think, um, mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah, if you forget to do that or whatever, whatever, you know, you might miss out on a few reps towards the end of the set. So you sort of need to be on top of that, which is what <sighs> makes the snatch kind of tricky, but also, you know, it's it's pretty achievable for most people as well to to get a good snatch set out. Mm -hmm. And 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 the the whole body benefits that you're getting out of it. You don't even have to compete. It's not about 24, 28, 32. Forget that stuff. It's just this such a fabulous exercise that works your body in a way that is so unique. That's why it's just powerful to learn it. And another thing that I think is also an interesting aspect to kettlebell sport, or just learning how to tense and relax. In a in a cyclical and rhythmic uh, uh, movement or pattern, this is just something that you can apply to life. Sometimes you have to be tense. Sometimes you have to relax. And and that's what they also call. And I got this from Yuri Berchosansky, um, which I've stumbled upon through through Pavel's uh, work. And he says, w when you are engaging into cyclic movements, you can tell the level of proficiency of a guy or a girl that's doing cyclic movements, you can see it in the face. So if the face is relaxed, then they are applying the perfect uh, sense or, or, or average speed of locomotion. They have great technique and they have great body awareness with their energy capacity, which I find so incredibly fascinating. And that's something that Bill, um, Bill Esch alluded to when I had a conversation with him and he said, you know, it's so crazy that these Russians have, have, have this game face. And I'm like, are you, got, are you having ice in your veins? What is this? And then so the, the Russian coaches told him, no, 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 it's all about perfecting the technique and getting better at it and not going crazy in your face. And this is something that is also very fascinating. Relaxation, no, no, attention, it, right? Absolutely. I, I remember when I did athletics, my coach would always talk about, we'd do the rose petal drill. Imagine we're holding rose petals in our hands. So we're trying not to crush them. We're just trying to 
you know, oh, wow. hold them there. So the I sometimes think of that in terms of kettlebell sport snatch, like wow. just apply enough force. Often I forget that though, but um, I actually <laughs> yeah, was yeah. much better at keeping a relaxed face, but now I have a child and um, yeah. these days I have a lot more caffeine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My face, uh, <laughs> you know, I think I'm relaxed and then you see these photos from the competition, you're like pulling oh, the, no, the weirdest no. faces and you're like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. a yeah. Special way, special set to, to pull that face. I used to be <laughs> awesome. much more relaxed with, with that stuff, but anyway. Awesome, awesome. So James, what I really want to uh, uh, move into a little bit is your research. And just if you could give us maybe just a few key takeaways. I mean, we have now learned um, that there is a classic and a modern type of, of snatching. We've also learned that there are uh, different benefits to it, and, and I think it also plays into your strengths or weaknesses, depending on the perspective. So, and you also mentioned that you had conversations with the Russian folks and with the Russian scientists, even though the methods probably weren't as as visible, right? Which is interesting to a science science guy, right? You want to know, okay, how can I replicate it, and how did you achieve it, right? But what are the biggest key takeaways from your uh, your research? In, in that regard yeah yeah so um, with my research um, I've been pretty fortunate that I was able to get in um, various different world champions that were traveling to Australia I was like come into the lab um, and do some testing and um, what I was sort of set out to do to some extent was just to document what they do and almost reverse engineer it mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so our first study we looked at the th essentially the technique or at least the trajectory of the kettlebell um, and um, like I alluded to before, we to, to do that, we had to learn this technology, this program called Vicon and hardware, which is very similar to what they use for animation for things like Shrek and things like that. <laughs> so, yeah, um, motion you capture. Know, we have these <laughs> yes. infrared cameras and stuff like that. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, so it was really cool. So, we basically documented that they, you know, had a C shape and typically that had a tighter sh C shape on the way down and a slightly larger C shape on the way up. And I came across sort of um, movement variability through this. So they'd have a little bit of a bandwidth in the, in the trajectory, but they'd all have a very, very tight fixation. And there's a concept in movement variability called um, low endpoint variability. So with a lot of cyclical sports, for example, running or swimming, or um, it's not a cyclical sport, but probably a good example is tennis serve. So um, a, a good performer, um, if you throw the tennis ball up, that's my serve, my tennis serve there. Um, you know, if it doesn't go up quite as high, you can maneuver your racket to hit in the same position that you would, you know, there's, there's some scope, but there's low endpoint variability because you're trying to hit a top spin or something like that. Or in the case of kettlebell sport, you have low endpoint variability in the fixation the, so does, you, that, does it does that mean low endpoint variability just for my understanding does it mean that there is not a lot of wiggle room it's it's almost kind of like always the same independent exactly, of the athlete. exactly okay. yeah okay. yeah yeah okay. so it's extremely consistent ah, now, consistent yeah move, okay. movement variability kind of say um you can have too much or too little but usually ah. um having a greater range of options is better. And for example, with my hamstring tendinopathy, my, you know, I couldn't bend forward so much. So I'd lost those, what we'd call degrees of freedom. So I would stop myself bending forward into a deep hinge for, for, you know, six months to a year or however long it took to deal with that injury. So pain actually reduces the movement variability and some injuries such, such as ACLs and things like that can yeah, be, if you have poor, if you can't land in a variety of different ways. So, Usually a good performer, or sometimes an analogy people use is a beginner does it right and wrong. They have a lot of movement variability, um, not necessarily, you know, some are right, some are wrong. An intermediate person does it right one way and an advanced person does it right multiple ways. Top of the pyramid, right? So it's yeah, always, yeah. So, ah. so you can see it in say a wimp, Olympic weightlifting, like someone, they miss one sort of phase slightly out of whack, but they can still save the lift because they can still get into a certain position or in kettlebell sport, um, you know, they can adjust uh, and perform the lift or they can just change it depending on their fatigue and, mm -hmm. you know, the context of what's going on. Mm -hmm. And so um, Sergey Rudnev put me in contact. Um, so he was my coach for a while. I learned a, a lot from him. Um, he put me in 
contacts with um, this Russian researcher called Vladimir Tikhonov, who sent me like this book, which is in Russian, um, sorry, an e-book. And I was sort of trying to, you know, trying to um, translate it and things like yeah. that. And yeah. it, you know, it have used terms like undermining and deflect and it's sort of slightly out of context. And it was very interesting though. And um, having some chats with him, he, um, it's it's clear that they sort of come from things from a slightly different angle to us, I guess. Um, and why do you think that is? Do you think this is a cultural thing, or do you just think they look they just look at things differently based on whatever? Yeah, it's really interesting. Um, I don't know exactly, but mm -hmm. like one thing that's actually really cool that um, this whole movement vari variability concept came out of. Um, I, I believe the Soviet Union. There's a, a guy Nikolai Bernstein. I believe mm -hmm. yeah, um, he was yeah. sort of uh, a researcher that looked at. You know, Verkhoshansky um, talks about him as well. Sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. there you go. Um, so you can look him up on YouTube. And so I, I put like little reflective markers on people and then would shoot infrared cameras. And at the time, they probably didn't have this technology because I, I believe he, he, um, he has this classic study where he looked at blacksmiths and like, how can they, you know, smash a hammer? I think there's a, you know, have, have many reps, like thousands of reps a day or, you know, mm -hmm. not, mm -hmm. not like a half an hour workout or an hour workout, like five hours just yeah. straight. Bang, And bang. so <laughs> yeah. this is kind of that concept of the low endpoint variability. They would hit in the right position, but the trajectory of the hammer would be slightly different. I'm sure they would get injured as well, but, you know, they would oh. swing the hammer ever so slightly differently all the time. And um, on YouTube, if you look him up, you can see that they get this gymnast. This is this is crazy to me. They put lights, like they turn the lights off. They put yeah. lights on his shoulder, like on the you know one on the shoulder, one on the elbow, one on the hip, like actual light glow, like light bulbs. And they make him do exercise and they film it. So that's kind of the same thing. Or to it's see like a the 2D, muscles, what? How, or, how... Yeah, to see the joint angles and things like and... that. So they turn the lights off. This person's like swinging around a bar in the dark I'm like it's so, <laughs> so we, we'd never wow. be allowed to do that stuff here that's no. just so dangerous but yes. you know it's i imagine oh. there's like power cords hanging off him because i feel like it's a of an age where any anyway like yeah i'm okay, like okay. Oh, that's really cool and um <laughs> that, some that sort of seems like that approach in terms of the movement variability is in some of the the russian lifters that i've talked to is you know, they will adjust their jerk thing or Sergei Rudnev would move around a little bit. Um, again, um, Sergei Ruchinsky, who um, I'm not sure if you've heard about him. He's a, another Russian coach. Um, he, I think, had the Guinness Book World Record for most weight squatted in an hour, which was something like he did a squat with 80 kilos every seven seconds for an hour. <laughs> And he did crazy. So he was uh, originally Dennis's, um, I believe one of his coaches. Mm. Um, and he did, I think hundred kilo squat, 213 times. Yes, man. And he was talking. Yeah. It's crazy. In one set. Um, <laughs> he was talking to me about, um, he was thinking about trying to break the deadlift world record and he's going to do, you know, 10 reps, like normally then 10 reps, like kind of rotational and then 10 reps, like he had this whole approach just to spread the load. So he's not just using that same movement pattern oh, the whole time. Oh, so oh. to me, when, you know, I only sort of discovered movement variability, I think maybe some physios or people who do rehab get in contact with it a bit earlier, but when I was just doing research, so, um, so it's a really interesting thing. So it seems like there's, you know, people say with science, you sort of stand on the shoulder of giants or the people who have come before you and you've got mm -hmm. sort of different contexts and different mm -hmm. maybe scientific papers that you look at a bit more and things mm -hmm. like that. So, and then also different, um, cultural things as well there's different interests and things like that mm -hmm. that, that people build on mm -hmm. but anyway i thought all that stuff's just so fascinating just how you know the the idea that technique is almost like a bandwidth in the sense that you can do technique right it's not just that's right that's wrong it's certain context and and those contexts change and being able to do things a variety of different ways is actually really good and and healthy for the body typically yeah now I'm not advocating people should try, try and do a hundred squats or whatever with a hundred kilos yeah, yeah. Um, and just change the technique ever so slightly. But I think in the context of wow. kettlebell sport, what 
what I sort of take away from it is you probably have your most efficient technique, but then at a certain point, maybe if your grip is giving out or your, you know, some things you might adjust your, you know, you might adjust to that squat snatch and that's not as efficient, but you know, it doesn't matter because you're going to drop the kettlebell yeah, and it gets, so the grip is the limiting the factor. Yeah. So it's yeah. whatever the limiting factor is mm. with, um, that's what you want to move so around. You, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, your body, it's so, so amazing how, how your body works and, and, um, Fascinating. you know, just fatigue management is such a big part of GS and it, it's such an interesting thing. Fatigue um, management. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. and just That's, having the ability, mm -hmm. so you, you might see, I'm, I'm sure people who do sort of, um, longer sets with kettlebell sport get to a point, say with the jerk and they just like, I can't get it out of the rack position, but say if you're able to adjust your technique so you could have a deeper second dip or something, mm -hmm. you might actually have the power, you know, you can only get the kettlebells up a certain height, but if you had that range oh, of motion, all those degrees quick. of freedom. Jump under the yeah. bell way more. Wow. And and now that you mentioned it, yesterday I was doing uh, some jerks and now I I would say after, after thousands of reps, I think I call it the Russian way of, of of jerking when I when I see the Russians do it it's for me it's just pure awesomeness uh, for example um, Markov um, I thought yeah, he's Ivan Markov, Markov he's a machine with 20 uh, with with 40s with with the 32s and and the speed so I studied him and Dennis for so long and I, I struggled so long with the jerk and now I kind of like get it another thing I, I think Khvostov, I think is his name. I can't, I can't just now phrase it, but I follow him on Instagram. Something that I saw with him is whenever he was going out of the rack, when he was going into the bump, it, it, it almost looked like he was snapping his spine in half. It, it was going forward, backward, so in, in such an extreme motion. That I was like, wow. So, I, and then I learned from Valerie, you know, it also depends on your anthropometrics. Do you have a long torso? Do you have long arms, short legs, uh, long legs? It all depends upon that stuff. But yesterday I felt like when I was doing the jerk, because you're mentioning movement variability, um, I, when I was co coming down from the jerk back into the rack position, I used to, I used to just bring the bells down, but my elbows were kind of like flaring to the sides. And that, all, that always cost me additional energy in the re-racking. So they went outside and then I had to go back in. So then I, uh, in a split second, I remembered that I think Dennis was talking about it, that when you go down back into the rack position, keep your elbows close so that you follow a better, uh, better way of a better trajectory. So I did this yesterday and come to find out if you drop from the rack, pulling your elbows in, dropping the weight it feels way more comfortable and you are way you're quicker in the in the rack position so that means you're saving energy and you're saving time so i think that's something that happens when you get used to the exercise and when you get a, a proficient at a level where you feel like wow now i can sort of like switch around a little bit in the movement variability variability and see how can i improve the lift right it's fascinating yeah, and I, sorry about my coughing, but um, totally I think it's um, it's really interesting what you're touching on there—the chest bump. And you know, if you can use your chest to help project your elbows yeah. up higher, that can be really useful. And that's an interesting point where kettlebell sport is quite different to a barbell jerk. So barbell jerk, you've racked it across yeah. your shoulders and collarbones, yeah. so mm -hmm. you, you keep your torso very stiff. You have With to. the kettlebell, mm -hmm. you you rack it essentially on uh, a belt or on your hips and um you know that well valerie talks about the five key points of the rack position or whatever but you know you've got it on your forearm and bicep and the elbow is embedded into your iliac crest or somewhere mm -hmm. on your body or, mm -hmm. or the belt depending mm -hmm. on the rules mm -hmm. and so you project your hips slightly forward and then power back up so you keep that you know, elbow body connection. Whereas with the barbell, you just keep the bar connected, you know, just by keeping your torso straight. Yeah. Whereas you need to apply your force through there. And that's a really common thing is people project out like that and they lose a lot of energy. So you want yeah. to press through like that. And then if you bring it back down, 
Same. Again, you're going to save a lot of energy. And then, you know, someone like Valeri would talk about spraying your T-shirt so you can sort of catch, you know, catch it and then it'll pull tight. So that that's a useful thing um, uh, that some people do. I find that yeah. very helpful Yeah. Wow. Um, just to help with the rack position. But, yeah, it's really fascinating how, how those guys move. Out. And like you sort of mentioned, everyone has slightly different body shapes and things like that. And you have a slightly different sequence as well. So depending on your body shape, if you have, you know, better, better posture or you know, maybe not better posture, but better rack position, you can really transfer a lot of force into the kettlebells. And then if you get that, you know, then you get that extra bump from your torso, you're getting the kettlebell quite high. Um, and then you just drop underneath that. And some of those guys are really fantastic uh, yeah. to watch them do that. It's really impressive. And it just it goes to show that the kettlebell, the, the way, you know, how I understand it from the his, historical perspective is back when, as far as I understand it, Dr. Krajewski traveled through Europe, was hanging around with all these strong men from, from, the, from, from Italy, from Germany, from, from, from the UK, England or whatever. So he took it back to uh, Russia. Then he started working with a guy named Ivan Lebedev and Pitla. I think Pitla was a very, uh, an awesome guy who came up with, with, for example, a long cycle idea, just cleaning it and bring, bringing it back up. But we can almost, mo I think it's safe to say that we can assume that it all evolved out of the barbell techniques, right? So even though it looks completely different now, uh, you still you have to snatch, you have to clean and jerk, you have to jerk, right? So since you're using submaximal weights, of course you're doing more reps. It's not just one, but we can safely assume that it all comes from the barbell, the way they were treating the barbell, right? So that's that's how it maneuvered into kettlebell sport. And then and we yeah, so, talked, yeah yeah go ahead. Oh no. So, um, like I mentioned with this book that I got off um, Vladimir Tikhonov, uh, uh, in in that, at least from my translation, sort of, um, or my understanding is circus performers and things like that were using the kettlebells or um, yeah. the gearers, mm -hmm. and they, they originally yeah. used for, as agricultural weights yes, for grains yes. and things like that. Yeah, markets, and that's yeah. a unit of measurement, the pood, which is why they come in sort of weird shapes initially. Mm. But now you can get them in two every two kilos or whatever. Um, and, you know, as you can well imagine, you know, if there's a heavy weight around, I'm sure guys are going to try and pick it up yeah. and juggle it or yes. do whatever, throw it at their friends or something. They think yeah. that's hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, my understanding is after World War II um, or in 1948, something like that, to get people back into the military, back into to training, that's where kettlebell sport sort of came in. And, and like you sort of said, it was sort of based on um, applying barbell stuff to the kettlebell or to a different implement and sort of that mixed implements approach is a really cool way to get some different movement variability in the sense um or you know you can just use different styles but you know you do a kettlebell jerk or a dumbbell jerk or a barbell book jerk it's slightly wow. different you know similar movements similar principles but your body adapts to it slightly differently and, and changes around um wow so i think and that's pretty cool and, and you're mentioning about uh, getting getting soldiers fit and ready for war. Um, I I'm now reading uh, or started to read the book, uh, the history, um, the Kings of Strength, from Edmond de Bonnet. Uh, Edmond de Bonnet was a, a French historian, and he uh, documented oh, cool. all the strongmen around. I think he went back into into the times of, of not the early Greeks, but somewhere around, for example, you have oh, well. Iskander Bey in there. That was an Albanian hero and it, it fascinating. It's a huge book and it costs a fortune, <laughs> but it's, yeah, right. it, it's, it's, it's now in, in, in paperback. And, uh, and he, he mentions this Edmond de Bonnet's vision was to, to get the Germans strong again through, through a physical culture because they lost the war. They were, you know, oh, they right. were occupied yeah, yeah. from the Germans. And so, and it, it's funny that you're mentioning this, that this was kind of like the idea in Russia, right? Or, or after, after the world wars. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I mean, I'm it's, no expert, but that's just what yeah, I Me read. neither. Yeah. But that's the same. It, it's so, it's interesting. This, it, it just coincides. And, and another thing now, since we touched on a little bit about the war, what I think, and I, I wonder what your uh, take on it is now I've had conversations with with a lot of guys from all around the world when it comes to kettlebells and I wouldn't say there is a gap 
but it feels like politics do play a role to a certain extent when when you ask an american the tendency is to be not maybe discard but, but not take seriously what the russians do and vice versa to a certain extent i've seen this online happen and w what is your take i mean being from australia i don't think you have the same political situation and we don't have to talk about co politics but the idea is how did you feel this was there some sort of ah eh, it's from the russians who cares but or is it no it's all about science and we don't care who comes up with the idea we just want to listen so in the context of kettlebell technique or like yeah, um, yeah. politics and in kettlebell sport or yeah oh just yeah in, in the context of kettlebells and and since you've had contact with the russian guys or the russian researchers how was it you know how you applied it and how was the reaction and stuff yeah so um in terms i, I know i got referenced by a couple of russian papers which is pretty cool so awesome. um i'm, I'm not mm -hmm. sometimes you get alerts on various different research things cool. about that cool um but yeah i think to be honest, people in Australia, um, it, it is quite far removed and we never got the RKC or we did, people came and did RKC courses and strong first courses, but there was quite a delay. And I think I mentioned to you, Steve Cotter was probably one of the yeah, first yeah. Yep. people mm. to come out and mm. do his own workshops um, in the late uh, 2000s, I think. But we sort of had our own sort of um, fellow who, who was a Russian military instructor um, and yeah, so he he sort of laid a bit of the foundation and, and they used some of the, the hard style stuff. And I think basically probably Australia to some extent is such a small community as well in terms of people who are lifting kettlebells. So it was pretty, we probably were almost more early adopters into kettlebell sport with um, Emily was quite good at promoting that because she worked, well, we all worked for a company called Iron Edge, which was, we were doing lots of workshops and things like that. Mm -hmm. And we would bring out um, a lot of these world champions and things like that to run courses and stuff like that. So she really spearheaded that. So I think, um, you know, everyone sort of had their own platform. But again, people can be really polarizing. But I think at the end of the day, we're all lifting kettlebells. And I think everyone can appreciate what the kettlebell sport guys do. And, you know, people can appreciate what the hard style people do as well. But what, like I sort of mentioned to you, I, I've, I encourage like a lot of hard style people to have a go at some of the kettlebell sport events. There's some that with a bit of training they I think they could do quite well in some, some of the pentathlons it would, would be hard, which is like mm -hmm. multi-switch mm -hmm. six mm -hmm. minutes, yeah. so yeah. on and so forth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, or like the military snatch, which is like the 12 minute multi-switch, which is pretty similar to the, I think they call it the secret service snatch test, which is like mm -hmm. 10 yeah. minutes multi-switch. Mm -hmm. So there's not that much of a difference there. So I think, you know, they could have a go of that and, potentially if they're pretty good even though they even though they use different mechanics you know what i and and i, I don't mean to interrupt but what no, i no. where where i see i mean I, I love where you're coming from me i i'm 100 percent behind this because that's why i i'm just calling this the hybrid idea yeah we just use the best of both worlds that have proven to work and then enjoy yourself that that's the idea of the hybrid style but one thing that i'm and i'd like to get your take on um is i've had this conversation with dan john and we talked about that, for example, um, when you are doing sports specific training, uh, I'll have, uh, Dan John calls it mixed training. So I'm just paraphrasing. He does a clean and jerk and then they do hill sprints and then they do some uh, drills for, for the discus, right? Mm -hmm. So then he said, uh, then we dived a little bit into this and I said, well, sports specific training, would that also include a baseball pitcher throwing a heavier ball and then he said no because if you use a heavier ball you might mix up these habitual movement patterns that you've created and you might mess them up it's like you're driving a bike where you are turning to the left side and the bike goes the other way you are messing up uh, habitual movement patterns that are so close to each other that once you sit back on the normal bike again you can't drive it so it would be the same with a baseball pitcher. And the reason why I'm saying the story is I feel like it's kind of like to a certain extent with the snatch. Just, just say it like the snatch. The hard style swing I don't think is a problem. Or, or I don't think we can do it because you use most definitely always or if you're proficient at it, heavier weights and then it works. But with the snatch, at least I felt it. 
if I start to incorporate a kind of a hard style snatch, which I have been taught by Luca, um, I, these movement patterns are so close to each other that I'm messing them up. So then I'm kind of like, no, I have to stick to some form of movement. And, and what is your take on it, on, on this, you know, movement patterns that are very close to each other. And if we start to just deviate a little bit, we probably mix them up or mess them up. Yeah, no, I, I think it depends as always. But again, to expand on that, I, th I would say, say if you're throwing a heavier baseball, um, potentially you're maybe loading the eccentric portion harder and um, but then the concentric portion is going to be a bit slower. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, yeah. you know, that might have a negative transfer and you might be better off just doing, you know, a less specific exercise that has better mm -hmm. transfer yeah. to the specific qualities that you're looking uh -huh. to train. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, I, I do some hard style or my version of a hard style swing um, variations on that. And I don't do any hard style snatches. Um, but so I, I think um, if, if you find that it has like a, what we'd say like a negative transference, then just avoid it. Yeah. But being yeah. able to do it or at least demonstrate it is probably not a bad thing to be able yeah. to do. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so, yeah, one thing that's really interesting is like there's people in kettlebell sport who do the, um, they do the hand insertion with the palm down or some that do it in that neutral grip. Typically, ah, the people yeah. with the neutral grip is who do more long cycle with the, that neutral grip ah, as well. Wow. So yep. that changes. So um, yeah, with the rotation, you, know, you of can the see yep. that mm. their, you know, long cycle has a good transfer to, or snatches has a really good transfer to the clean of the long cycle. It's a really great way to to build the grip strength, but you might get better transference if you train it, you know, with that neutral sort of ah, um, yep. grip as opposed to whatever mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but um yeah no i mean at the end of the day um i, I think we have to find yeah, out you, huh? and see if it yeah. messes up if it messes up your system you you get them probably just avoid and i think it, it's right? probably an easy thing to, to to some things are probably easy to test yeah. in the sense that um mm -hmm. you could mm -hmm. if you just feel that it oh it's changing my technique you know i know some people don't like presses because they feel like they press their jerks too much but i think uh, it depends mm. some people probably really benefit from being stronger overhead but the, mm. usually the people who start to press they're pretty strong at pressing anyway so they yeah. don't, they're kind yeah. of reinforcing a strength as opposed to training a weakness um and, and i felt that i felt that when i was doing uh, steve carter's uh, ikff ckt2 test we had to do a biathlon double 20s for uh, 40 uh, 40 jerks and then nice. I had to do 100 snatches with a 20. And my technique was off back then. That's three years ago. But I managed to push through because I was stronger. Because I was just lifting heavy stuff back then way more than I do now. But yeah, I think nice. the, the, the essence, that's why I love Sean Mosen's description. He just says, listen, you grab a kettlebell, you either do high volume or you do high tension. And that determines the movement pattern. And I think that that's that's such a great uh, catchphrase to sum it all up to understand. Yes, if I want to press a heavy kettlebell, I probably have to use more tension that I would snatch a heavy kettlebell for longer sets of time, right? So that's... Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, it's interesting. Also coming back to sort of what I was talking about with relaxation, maybe for myself initially learning like a hard style snatch, I have to be conscious that I don't, you know, my intention is not to do it as fast and, and as aggressively as possible. My intention is to do it as easily as possible and smoothly and minimal effort to prolong performance for that 10 minute or whatever I perceive, you know, if mm -hmm. I'm doing a half an hour set or a mm -hmm. 10 minute set or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever minute set, um, you know, so you sort of have that feed forward context. So you, you, you know, I'm going to do this amount. So I set my, parameters so it's like you know you wouldn't sprint if you're sprinting for you know 10k you would sprint if you're sprinting yeah. for 100 meters yeah so if you set your intention that can that can be really useful and that sort of comes into that fatigue management sort of thing you can obviously fatigue yourself and then just try to hold on on hold on for dear life or you can just try to be a bit smarter and manage it and, and yeah. just Mm -hmm. move through and, it as best you can and both can make sense to a certain degree where you're like okay i want to push myself to the utmost level and see what i can manage 
and and uh, I mean isometrics are something that is so incredibly brain damaging <laughs> to a certain extent where you're almost just fi frying your brain but uh, then in the long run isometrics can maybe help you to develop more strength for for a bench or a squat or whatever so there there are both sides right and that's something that we have to understand uh, absolutely and in the context maybe this is a good example of the transference kind of thing or what i was getting at with the heavy throw so when i'm starting to taper for kettlebell sport i i tend to focus more actually for strength training just minimum effective dose mm -hmm. um but more strength exercises as opposed to um some people like who do like hundreds of jump squats and things like that which is terrific to develop um mm -hmm. you know local muscular endurance and things like mm -hmm. that for, mm -hmm. for me i'm better off um putting more resources into doing more jerks and things like that as in like mm -hmm. recovery resources but I would say go from doing a front squat for, you know, lower reps to doing an isometric because it's quite easy to recover from. And if I do an isometric at the point of my second dip, um, so I get, you know, good, good um, input into my legs so I can maintain mm -hmm. my strength mm -hmm. and you build up that muscular tenderness stiffness in that range. So mm -hmm. it makes you kind of more efficient, hopefully, or at least that's the goal. Mm -hmm. um, in that range of motion so it's interesting so that should in in my head at least have a positive transfer to my jerk technique because i've been reinforcing where my second dip is or first dip sort of knee oh. angle and and just training that Love and if by training it in an mm. isometric way for five to ten seconds um you know hopefully that doesn't have a negative transfer but rather you know it's a, mm. an easy yeah. way to get some strength through there without creating wow. more fatigue into my system oh, I, I see or, or minimizing the fatigue. I love it. I see where you're coming from. And you're talking about the second dip in the jerk, right? Where you are keeping the kettlebells in the top fixation. You are in that second dip and then you hold it, right? Mm -hmm. That's a technique that Dennis uh, teaches as well, Dennis Vazadev. And, and, yeah, and he's fantastic at, because um, he's probably so close to his genetic potential. He has yeah. to do like crazy yeah. you know, jump yeah. squats and things like that to, yeah. to get his body to adapt. Whereas for me, I'm, and I think, to be honest, for a lot of people who didn't start kettlebell sport from a young age, they're probably better off saving their recovery stuff to do more kettlebell sport stuff and then just do more general strength stuff, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. as fatiguing. And it depends. And if you can identify your weaknesses, then you can refine them. Mm -hmm. But for a lot of people, um, like I've done 10-minute squats and 5-minute squat sets, um, and you know, I found actually that that, when I was doing five minutes of deep squats, that was great for building up my quad endurance, but it really aggravated that hamstring tendinopathy. Wow. So I sort of moved away from that. I'm like, oh, I can do, you know, a lot heavier for fewer reps. Mm. I won't do that many sets because I, but then mm. I'll just do, instead of doing that five minute set of squats, I'll just do another set of jerks or something mm. or a different yeah. set of jerks, like a one arm set of jerks or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something like that. Wow. Um, and I found that to be beneficial for, you know, for myself and usually people I train as well. And and in certain times and contexts, you can put in the, the higher rep jump squats and the rhythm squats and things like that, that can be useful. And it just goes to show that, first of all, you have to listen to your body, see how it reacts, and then apply different types of styles, training, and, and just, it's it's an experiment, right? It, it It's something that I have now come to understand. The more that I learn about this stuff, I, sometimes I feel like the less I know. <laughs> but Absolutely, yeah. But it's just the re, the plain reality of, we. yeah, I love how you framed it. It's like, yeah, we are the same species, but we have individual aspects to each other that maybe we, we can't just walk around and say, well, this is the only proper version to do something, even though we can say, I like your idea of this movement variability, right? There are certain principles that you have to follow in order to reach this type of technique, right? But it's not carved into stone where you have to say, well, if it doesn't look like this, it's going to be wrong. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think, uh, what was I going to say? We can with everything we can just if you are your sort of n equals one experiment like i i'm lucky enough to have force plates in my gym so i can measure people's strength really closely um but you know if what what really attracted me to kettlebell sport and athletics is like if i got faster it's you know a fair chance that 
you know, a lot of it's to do with my program because it's not a chaotic environment such as like a team sport and things like that. Mm-hmm. My key performance indicator is my outcome in the sport. So mm-hmm. I can look back at my training. I improved, you know, what, what can I, I just refine yeah. to do? Yeah. I didn't improve, you know, maybe sometimes you have a bad day or like you have things out of your control that you can't, you know, deal with. But generally speaking, if you're improving, then you can kind of refine and just, you know, yeah. mold your program so you, you do get, mm-hmm. and then you can re rerun that cycle and just modify it and just if you've made some notes, you can adjust it accordingly, yep. and you know, yep. that that way, hopefully, you sort of can progress and do better and better. And that's something that's pretty cool about kettlebell sport is you can just sort of, it's, you know, like Olympic lifting, the sport is kind of the the training as well in the sense yeah. so it's kind yeah. of different from baseball where baseball it's not you're not really in the gym throwing a baseball you know mm-hmm. you, you, mm-hmm. Do you do other stuff whatever then, squats yeah, yeah. or whatever mm-hmm. to train the specific muscles involved mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. it's it's a little bit different yeah. love it great james on, on a final note first of all um i I have to say thank you. You've shared so much valuable information and you're adding to this, you're, you're expanding my horizon to the knowledge of understanding that the individual aspect, I love how you shared the scientific approach. And on a final note, James, um, because I think I wanna include this in the podcast, we have a lot of coaches listening and watching. So what what would be your advice to, to a coach who is either starting out or maybe stuck, or maybe they want to start with kettlebells or whatever, just in a few sentences, sentences, what would be your greatest advice? Yeah, well, I mean, having a system is really useful and having a framework in, in your mind. So kind of like with our gym, we would typically try to get someone to be able to uh, do a hip hinge exercise. That could be with a barbell or a kettlebell, typically just a Romanian deadlift then we can progress that to say a swing mm-hmm. or we could progress that, you know, add weights or go to a single leg deadlift. So, you know, you have that movement pattern that you're reinforcing mm-hmm. in a variety mm-hmm. of different ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so again, once you establish the hips hinge, then you can add the swing, so on and so forth. So if you have that kind of approach, like, you know, if I have good range of motion overhead and a good rack position, then I can add the press you know that by applying that sort of methodology so if you can just you'll save yourself a lot of trouble if mm. you can you know get mm. people if they can if you know someone can do a good hip hinge they should be able to do a good swing or at least mm-hmm. they have the ability to learn but if they can't do mm-hmm. a hip hinge now i'm not saying you have to have a you know perfectly neutral spine like we we're sort of discussing before but mm-hmm. you know if you know that they have that ability to move that over time they can sort of mold their technique and, and things like that but again, it comes back, to, I, I would say, having a system mm-hmm. and then just progressing uh, slowly and just making small changes over time is, is probably the, the, the main thing. And if you can, you know, if they can show that they've got good range of motion or perform the range of motion, then you can sort of start to progress different things. Mm. And if you just break down the movements, um, you know, you can just over time add complexity. For example, mm-hmm. you've got the hip hinge. Okay, we progress to the swing. Okay, we, we've also been doing the rack position and the press or the push press. You know, we move to the push press. Okay, we can stop the weight quickly. Now we can start thinking about, you know, doing the clean or one arm swings and then the clean. Mm-hmm. And then once you've got that, mm-hmm. then it'll be so much easier than just teaching the snatch no. yeah. straight away. So yeah. if you can establish all those yeah. things first, you're setting yourself up for success. So I try to be as lazy right? mm-hmm. as possible in the sense of teaching. I try to yeah. teach things that will sort of set people up for success to the point where they're like, oh, I can just do it kind of thing. Yeah. And, I mean, you have yeah. people that are really gifted and can just sort of do oh, things yeah. straight away, but, and then well, there's other people who just really struggle. Yeah, so, yeah you, most definitely. We, we, I think we could do a whole podcast about the ins and outs of coaching people. Uh, that will be a, a, a another episode, but I love what absolutely. you're saying. It's just uh, trusting the fundamentals, knowing how to progress, and, and, and knowing the limitations of your clients, right? And then working from there, but I love it. Just have, have a good system and then tweak it a little bit. Yeah, that's, that's great advice. Always trust the basics, it's, it's awesome. Yeah, definitely. So, James, uh, thank you so much for this awesome conversation. No, it's thank gonna you, be, it's been a real pleasure. 
Awesome, awesome, appreciate it. If you're looking for kettlebell courses that can help you lose weight, build muscle, and improve your kettlebell technique, then check out the Leberstock Academy. Let us help you discover a new perspective on kettlebell training, making it simple and easy for you to understand. Join the waiting list of your desired course now and secure your spot when it's open for enrollment. Link is in the description.